Welcome everyone to our Saturday speaker meeting. Um, today, appreciate y'all joining us. Uh, today, we're happy to welcome Rose Road. And Rose has a doctor of physical therapy. She works with Sharp Memorial Hospital. Uh, she has certification in vestibular rehabilitation. Um, she's going to talk a bit today about um, balance and fall prevention. And, you know, she'll have a particular focus on brain injury. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Rose. Uh, hi, Rose. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm doing great. Great. Well, thanks for Happy joining to us today. Here. Thank you so Happy much. To be here. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about yourself and your experience uh, working with brain injury survivors and experience at, uh, at Sharp. Um, I could just start the presentation by saying that um, purely by being here and listening, you're taking active steps towards improving your stability on your feet just by being here. Yeah. So I'm happy for that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, if you want to share your screen and we'll get into your presentation. All right, Rose, it's all you. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. So today, I'm going to try to explain to everyone uh, the components of good balance. So anyone who's alive and moving on their feet can certainly uh, work towards improving their balance. And it, to do that, we have intrinsic factors having to do with you, your personal body. And we have extrinsic factors it's a lot different for you to walk down the hall versus walking outside on the front lawn. So the extrinsic factors. And then hopefully this, will this lecture will help people identify their own personal needs. So we're talking about um, it, in the worst situation, a fall. And that is when anyone unintentionally comes to rest on a lower level. So if you are walking by a couch and you tripped a little and you landed on the couch and you thought, whew, good thing I didn't fall. That actually is a fall. So anything from up to lower. And Rose, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but, and you may mention this, but you know, falls are up there on the list of things that uh, are the primary causes of brain injury as well. And it's particularly important for our community because if you've had a brain injury, and you're a bit unstable or have vestibular issues, um, you know, fall can result in you having, you know, another brain injury. So it's definitely, you know, pertinent to, to our community and something to really, you know, be aware of. Thank you, Kurt. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're not talking about a stumble. If you were walking and you kind of lost your balance and you caught yourself, everybody does that and you go about your business and you forget about it. What's more important is not falling. We want to teach people and teach their bodies how to react so that you stumble as opposed to fall in situations where you trip a little bit. So these are some scary stats. A little, this, a, a little bit of this information is swayed towards elderly population because that's where the studies are found. So one out of three people over the age of 65 will fall. That's a lot of people one out of two over the age of 85. And this is really important. Two thirds of those people who fall will fall again within six months. And there's reasons for that, we'll go over. So falls, never mind having getting a brain injury, it can actually result in death. And it's the most common cause of uh, non-fatal injuries and hospital admissions. And it costs a lot of money to care for people that have fallen. So there's a lot of factors that are concerning. So some of the injuries that occur with the fall is uh, maybe a hip fracture or head trauma. Those are some simple stats about um, numbers of people. We're talking about millions of people that are affected by falls. And Falls account for greater than 90% of hip fractures in older folks. Now a simple hip fracture, um, a lot of people recover. 
one out of four recover fully, but then some people need to be uh, spend more time in a nursing facility or a rehab facility. And then oftentimes people will need to use a, an assistive device. And then this stat is, is horrifying and it's one I share all the time. 20% of people that get a hip fracture will die within a year. So that, so you never want anybody to minimize the effects of a fall because you may not get that injured. Like maybe someone considers a, a hip fracture. Well, that bone will heal, but there's sequelae that occur from that. And, that, and that's when it becomes e even worse than the initial injury. Saying this, so most falls do not result in serious physical injury, but consequences can result. There are physical consequences and then psychological consequences. So once you've fallen, it's, uh, it's now said in your mind that you don't want that to happen again. It's embarrassing, it hurt, it's scary. But that fear in your brain can, um, in the future, create a situation where you're more likely to fall. And how we address that is with therapy would be the right on the top of the list is to go see someone that specializes in managing the body and educating the brain how to function properly on your feet and educate the person to have a good environment that they're moving around in. So the risk factors for falls are intrinsic. So having to do with the person's body and then extrinsic. So in intrinsic factors, this is all about you and your body. We, your body gets this sensory input from the environment. It helps to tell the body where it is in space. So the brain gets all this information from different parts of the body, and then it puts an output. So a bunch of information comes in, the brain figures it out, and then movement comes out. What kind of, oh, that screen's a little messy. Sorry about that. What kind of input comes in? Well, as you can imagine, as a person, you're seeing what's happening. You have sensations on your body, particularly your feet and your joints. You have hearing what's coming at you possibly hearing as if walking down the hallway, you might hear something coming up behind you. And you have your inner ear system, which is one of the biggest inputs for your balance. So the information from your eyes, the information from your body, your feet, your joints, and your hearing, and your inner ear balance system all comes in all at once to the brain. And a lot of the information is redundant, which is awesome. So the brain has all this good information and then it reacts. How does it react? With a certain flexibility. That's the first word that seems to be missing there. With your strength, your coordination and your endurance. So the information comes in, the brain figures it out and then there's an output. Now, mind you, this is happening like this, very, very quick. We don't really think about these things. In therapy, we teach people to think about them and then eventually, hopefully the brain does its job and you don't really have to think about it anymore. So here's some information about the sensory input coming in. For your vision, it requires focal and central acuity. You have to be able to see. In other words, if you need glasses, you should be wearing them. That will support your balance. You need to have good peripheral vision to see what's coming or, or where you're moving toward. And biocular vision using both eyes gives us an awareness, awareness of depth perception. Because of course, in our world, everything isn't flat and even. Poor vision, sometimes people have poor vision and this is what can happen. Difficulties with curbs or walking on uneven surfaces. But you have to remember that even someone who's blind is walking down the street. So that's the beauty of that word redundancy. So lots of information coming in, and it's all hopefully saying the same thing. 
And if one system isn't working as well, the other systems can, can support the brain to figure out the balance. Now we have our, in addition to our vision, we have our body sensations. Sent, sensory receptors in the skin, the muscles, the tendons, the joints, tell your brain your body position. Again, this is all just happening naturally. Very important are our feet, our ankle, uh, the information coming from your feet, like ankle position. And there's a lot of bones in your feet and in between each bone is a joint and all that little movement of the joints goes immediately to your brain to help you navigate in your world. We feel the feet, un uh, we feel the feet, we feel the floor under our feet and the, like the joints in our, in our neck, when I move slightly, that information goes to my brain. We just don't think about it. it tells my brain, I just turn my head a little bit. And I will tell you when I did that, I actually, my bottom, my butt, cause I'm sitting on a chair, told my brain I shifted a little bit. All of that redundant information about what my body's doing right now. So we have a lot of people that have a lot of problems with their feet, they're numb. Maybe they have a nerve injury, um, a diabetic neuropathy. And what happens in that case, it makes it difficult to walk in the dark or uneven surfaces. And this is going ahead, but the reason for that is our brain loves the redundant information. Everything coming in is saying the same thing. I'm walking down the hall. If my feet are numb and I don't really know where they are, and it's a dark hall, I can't really see, then that makes it less stable for me. And then if you add uneven ground, that's even worse. So our hearing is very important. It allows us to localize sounds, especially hazards, things coming at us. If you were gonna cross the street and you weren't paying attention and someone beeped at you, that information is critical for your balance so that you don't get stunned when you all of a sudden see the car in front of you and it allows you to react better. When you have hearing deficits, it uh, decreases your ability to localize the sounds and the hazards coming at you. It increases your need for a quicker reaction because you didn't know that person was coming up behind you on their bike. Going back to the hearing, remember, and I'll say this all, all morning, is there's redundant information. So some people are deaf, they have no hearing. They're still walking around because the brain is using all the other inputs. Now our inner ear, in addition to the hearing, there's a system called the vestibular system. It's, um, it's like a gyroscope. There's a right side and a left side. This little tiny, tiny system. It's the size of my pinky nail. It has little uh, canals and there's three on each side and they give the brain information because there's fluid in them of where the head is. Dogs, cats, horses, they all have that same vestibular system. Very critical for our brain to know where our head is provides information on positions of the head related to gravity. It gives information on your speed of motion when you're walking or turning. Or if you're standing still, it gives us information that we're still. When there's an issue with the vestibular system, which could be one-sided or it could be both sides, you can get vertigo or dizziness jumping vision, imbalance, or nausea. This part of the lecture doesn't get into detail, but it's so interesting and important to understand the vestibular system because so many people are affected by it. Again, say both sides just aren't working as well as they should. The vestibular system is one of the big inputs for our balance. And so if that system isn't working as good as it should, and my vision isn't as good because I'm a little older or I have an eye injury. And let's say maybe I can't really feel my feet. That's a lot of um, information missing to the brain. And remember the brain loves all this redundant good information. 
that vestibular system, not only can you have a decrease in the whole system, maybe one side is impaired. Maybe there's an injury to that part of the brain or the, the blood flow to that side, or there's inflammation from a virus. When that happens, then people can feel really dizzy because the input just from the right and the left side isn't good. It doesn't match. And the reason the word jumpy vision is in there is because our inner ear vestibular system has a direct dialogue with our eye muscles, which makes a lot of sense because as I sit here and I tip my head up or I tip it to the side, my computer screen's not also tipping to the side my eyes, instead of going with my head, they level out. So the vestibular system helps to keep our gaze stable. And if there's an impairment with the vestibular system, sometimes our gaze isn't stable and then the world isn't stable. And if the world's not stable when I'm looking at it, that increases my chances of feeling dizzy or falling. So I'm going to go, uh, Go back. So all of that information, and the reason I keep repeating myself is repetition is the mother of retention. And I want you guys to really get this information because I've been working with people with balance issues, particularly for 15 years, maybe a little longer. I've been a physical therapist for 20 years, but I've specialized in balance for 15 and I absolutely love it. And one of the reasons I love it is because when people decide to better themselves and their physical balance, and I give them the tools, magic happens, their balance improves. It's almost like a, a person playing sports. They go out there and they swing the bat and they miss the ball. If they practice, they're gonna hit the ball. Same thing with our balance. If we practice, it's going to improve. So all of that information that's coming in, our sensory input, the three big ones, our vision, our sensation from our feet and our joints and our inner ear vestibular system are saying the same thing and they help to keep us balanced. And when one of them isn't working, the other ones take over. If there's a, but you wanna to come to therapy to make sure that they're working at their highest level of function. Some of it we can fix if it's missing, some of it we can't, but we can boost the other systems to work well. So all that information comes into the brain. So optimal functioning of your brain is required to perform the rapid processing. I mean, this is happening immediately. And then the brain takes that information and it, it sends a reaction to information to the body so that we can react, so that we can take our next step, so that we, if we take a step and we miss the bottom step, that maybe we react quick. Anything that affects attention and alertness can affect your balance. So the, in, those, the sensory input from our sensation of our feet and our joints, our vision and our inner ear system comes into the brain and then our body responds. What do we need for our body to respond? We have to have a certain flexibility, particularly your hamstrings, your heel cords at your ankles and your hip flexors. Why do we need to be flexible? Because our body needs to move. And if things are tight, then that joint's gonna hold you back from moving appropriately. So you need to be flexible. And we look at that in physical therapy. That's one of the background pieces right away. We look at flexibility. And here it is, especially your feet and your ankles. Those are your foundation. Every step you take, your feet and your ankles are, are the first to hit the ground. You need to be flexible in your torso, particularly your hip flexors. And then your neck and your shoulders needs to be flexible. If I'm stiff and I'm walking, that's gonna affect my balance. So foot problems, we know double the fall risk. I just said, why? Because that's your foundation. Everything your body does starts down at the feet. This is a scary stat. Neck stiffness increases fall risk four times. The remedy for this is exercising with stretching for inflexibility. 
one of, you know, some people will say, I'm, I'm just not that flexible. I've never been flexible. You have to put the effort in and your body is meant to improve. So, I, you know, that's like the big over overshadow of all of this. Our bodies are beautiful. They are meant to improve. We just have to do what we're educated to do. So in addition to being flexible, we need to be strong enough to hold our bones up. In the very basic sense, I also, so I work in outpatient people, you know, walk in to see me to work on their balance, but sometimes I cover an inpatient. And if you have strength deficits, you can't even like sit on the edge of the bed and hold yourself up. That, that's like a, a very uh, basic comment about strength. But when there's strength deficits, you have to be able to like lower your body if you're walking down the step. You have to be able to lift your body up if you're walking up on a curb. You have to be able to get out of the chair safely. You need to be strong enough in your legs. So weakness in the legs also four times the fall risk. So now we know that if our necks are stiff, we're increased fall risk four times. If our legs are weak, we increase our fall risk four times. Again, here's the secret, exercise to increase your strength. And one of the things about the flexibility and the strength is there's this beautiful phrase. It's like, in a year from now, you'll be happy you started today. It's not gonna happen overnight, but you just gotta commit, work on these factors, and then down the road, you'll see your gains. So coordination, you have to react to movements of your body. I mean, think about your body. I don't know how tall everybody here is. Maybe you're four foot, maybe you're six feet. You have these little feet. Even the biggest foot is kind of small compared to the height of a person. So you have to be coordinated to manage that whole body on these little feet. Coordination involves speed, degree of effort, and timing. Timing is probably the biggest one. If I'm falling and I have a delayed reaction information coming from my brain and my step is delayed, I'm gonna, already gonna be on the floor. So we have to have good timing and we practice that in physical therapy. Just like the kid with the bat practices his timing, it gets better. Posture, we need good posture for a million reason, reasons. It uh, allows our joints and our muscles to work the best that they can. So without good posture, that's when you can get some stiffness, some pain, some arthritis, and that's going to negatively impact your balance. I mean, what happens is gravity is taking us down. It's constantly beating on us at, on earth here. And people's heads go forward, their shoulders go forward, their trunk goes forward, they get tight hip flexors. What we want is good posture. It's good for a million reasons. Never mind balance. It's good for breathing. It's good for digestion. It's good for um, being present in a room with other people. When you're down here, your gaze is down. We want to have good posture. So a flex posture uh, and, and poor leg coordination together, again, here's that four times more likely to fall. So we know that all of these things through studies, if, if they're there, you increase your fall risk. So we want to address all of these issues. Endurance. So cardiopulmonary fitness is a baseline requirement. If I get tired and out of breath, just walking from one room to the other, that increases my chances of falling. First of all, I, I might start to panic. Um, that may be a very uncomfortable feeling. So my brain is busy feeling out of breath and it's not paying attention to all the input. And if it doesn't get all the input, the output's not going to be good. So we need to have good endurance. There's another part of endurance that's important. It's not just cardiopulmonary endurance, it's musculoskeletal endurance. Like maybe, you know, you can um, get off of a chair once, but can you, can you do it a few times if, and, and have that strength and that endurance in your muscles? When you're tired, it decreases your alertness, your awareness, poor coordination, posture, gentle weakness, all of this results in a higher fall risk. So you need to have good endurance, but we also need to have rested bodies and minds. So in a summary to our bodies, our intrinsic factors for balance, it's our vision, 
our sensory input, particularly from our feet and our joints, our inner ear system, our balance system that's telling our brain where our head is, and then our hearing of the world around us gets into the brain, hopefully all of it saying the same thing, and then the brain quickly puts an output. And the output is dependent on your flexibility, your strength, your coordination, and your endurance. So when you come into therapy, and you know, at some point, everybody should go see a balanced therapist. At least I say everybody at the age of 65, even if they have no issues, because I'll find an issue and you work on it and then you can avoid things in the future. But at a younger age, if there's any impairments occurring, come see a balance therapist. The balance therapist will do an assessment and look at those sensory inputs. How is your brain, no, how is your vision? We look at your vision, not like the eye doctor, but sort of, your, how is your vision? How is your brain using your vision? How is your vision with body movements? We look at your sensation. Can you feel sensation on your feet? We test that. Can you feel joint position? We test that. How is your brain using your inner ear system? We test that. We, we don't test hearing, but you can let us know if you need to wear hearing aids, then you need to wear hearing aids because that hearing is important. And then during the evaluation, we look at your output. What is your strength and flexibility and coordination? And then how do you react to movement? Static movement, just standing there and dynamic movement, moving, walking down the hall. And pain, a, a lot of people have pain. Pain, it just, it, it impacts the brain. The brain is thinking about the pain, thinking about the pain, or, you know, it's shocking, whatever. And it takes away the brain's ability to take all that input and give you a good output. So you have to manage your pain. You know, I'll pause here and see if there are any questions about your intrinsic factors. So stuff about you for your balance. So the first thing is the subjective information. Tell me about yourself. What is it that you do on a daily basis? What is it that you plan to get out of therapy? This is about you, right? I'm just there. Yeah. So, so we get subjective information. And then the evaluation, the physical part. I would test your sensation on your feet, including light, touch, and vibration to see it. the vibration uh, helps us to be aware of how your brain is processing joint movement. Okay, so that's sensory input. We look at that. I test your strength in your legs and your flexibility. Actually, your strength in your arms too, because sometimes people use assistive devices. So your strength and your flexibility. That's kind of the background information. And then we assess how your brain is using your inner ear system, your vestibular system and your vision. So what does that mean? I certainly test vision with an eye chart. What is your vision? And then I test your vision with movement. What is your vision with movement? Because we're not all sitting here reading, we're moving around and we have to have a certain ability to stabilize our gaze with movement. So we look at that, but the real way that we look at the three main systems for balance, sensory input, vision input, and inner ear input, is we decrease your base of support. So I have people put their feet together. And we could even decrease it more. I could have you stand on one leg. And then I might have you moving your head so that you're not able to use your vision well, or you have to interpret what you're seeing. And moving the head also stimulates the inner ear system. And I look at how you, how you react to that. Sometimes I'll say, close your eyes. I'll take your vision completely out of the picture. And I'll look at how you're using your inner ear system and your sensory input. How about if I put you on a piece of foam? That's not very stable. And I close your eyes. So remember the big three, sensory, vision, inner ear. You're on the foam. Sensory take your vision away using your inner ear system. It's really pretty awesome. We get a baseline on the first day and then we come up with a game plan. We're gonna do these strengthening exercises. We're gonna do these stretching exercises. And then we're gonna start tuning up the brain's use of those three inputs, sensory input, visual input, and inner ear input. And as a former athlete, cause I have children and I don't exercise as much as I should. I don't play in sports now. 
Um, sometimes when I'm explaining it, well, actually probably every time I explain it, this is kind of really silly and weird. We stand in a corner of a room on a piece of foam and I challenge you with a different foot position. Yours would be very different than the next guy. And we get your head moving. We close your eyes and get your head moving. And it's kind of weird. It works. And as soon as you master what I asked you to do, I make it more challenging. And our, your bodies, I mean, they just eat this up. They want to function better. I hope that answered your question. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay, cool. I hope I see you at Sharp. Come on in. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. It's a good that, time. Was, it, that was a great, thoughtful answer. Thank you. Oh, sure. Okay, I'm going to move on. So guess what? We have our bodies and we have to take care of our bodies, but our bodies are in the environment and we have to be aware of what our environment looks like and how we can impact it. So home design has been implicated in a third to half of falls in, in, in adults, right? So I'm looking at my, you guys can't see it, but I'm looking at my living room. We, we bought this house, we're, we're the, I think third owners, and our living room is down two steps. You know, why do they do that? They were not thinking about people that are aging in place in their homes, right? If my friend's parents had the same situation and they actually filled in their living room, they didn't want the risk. They're totally moving. They're running around, living their lives, but they knew we just don't want that stuff in our house. It just doesn't seem safe. That was a, a brilliant move on their part. Um, more than half of fatal falls happen at home. So our homes are a great place to start. We spend most of our time at our home. Let's try to make our environment safe. And uh, recurrent falls are a common reason for hospital admissions of previously independent older folks, and they have to go to long-term care facilities. So what can we do for our homes? We have to have good lighting. So remember, we can have a visual impairment from an injury, from aging, from our, our genetics, you know? So we need to have a well-lit area for moving around in that will help us with our balance. Uh, sometimes uh, glare can affect um, your vision of what you're seeing. And when you go from outside in the bright sun to inside, sometimes it, it, you know, it can be a little dark. So you have to pause and give yourself some time. So you can use increased wattage in your lights. You can have um, the motion sensors. So if you get up in the middle of the night and you don't want to leave the lights on because you can't sleep. So, but if you had a motion sensor, it'll automatically go on. Uh, clappers or touch controls, you can put it on before you have to walk across the room in the dark. Night lights, and I don't like dark. I like to have lights on at night. You can have night lights around your home. Wear sunglasses if there's um, glare. Soft white bulbs are more readily um, help with our vision. And again, when you move from an, a bright area outside to inside, pause to allow your eyes to adjust. So clutter, this says with age, but really, I think it's just our culture. We have a lot of clutter. You got to get rid of it. You got to clean up because uh, we may not see it. Um, it increases your trip or your fall hazard. So you want to arrange your furniture, I think, for some feng shui as well as for safety. You know, if the pet dishes are in the way, well, let's find a better spot for them. Uh, you don't want cords going across the room in the wrong spot. Use cordless devices makes uh, for a safer environment and decorate with contrast. Um, friends of mine also have one step in their house in a weird spot and they, they're redoing the flooring. They're going to have like a brown wood put right along the edge of the step down and then the, the lighter wood. It's going to be beautiful one, but also it'll allow them to see it or for other people to see it. People don't expect a step to be in your living room sometimes. And, and if, they, if they're not paying attention, they may miss it. But with contrast, you can see it better. So throw out throw rugs. There's no need for throw rugs, especially here in Southern California. I'm from New England. I'm from Massachusetts. We have rugs. We have rugs. We have rugs because your feet are freezing. It's always cold. But here, get rid of the throw rugs. They are a safety hazard. It's a known safety hazard. So get rid of them. And here's that sunken living room. You have to mark the, the steps so people see it. Even thresholds should be marked because uh, oftentimes where the door comes in or a sliders come in, there's a little bit of a step and people inevitably trip over it. it I had one patient once, this is so perfect for the story. She was getting her, her rugs 
here in Southern California redone. And she's just telling me that she got this expensive, super cushy. And I looked at her in shock and she was really impaired with her balance. I said, do you know what it's like for you to stand on that piece of foam? She's like, yeah. I said, now your whole room is going to be that. She looked at me in horror. She's like, you're right. I'm like, yeah, no, no. You And she had plenty of a nice budget. So she ended up changing it to a really flat, tight woven Berber, I think it's called. And that I'm sure we'll never know what she avoided. I know what she avoided, but we'll never really know what she avoided. You want to avoid um, your floors being so clean that they're slippery. And if you do have to use um, a mat, make sure it has a rubber back so it doesn't slip. And in your showers, you know, um, if you're redoing them or something, you could think about having something put in that's not slippery, or you can put in a non-slip um, mat. With stairs and steps, they actually make a special paint that has more of a grit to it. So it gives you some traction. You wanna use uh, rubber safety treads. On stairs, having a light switch at the top and the bottom makes sense. And probably newer homes all have that because of the rules, but older homes may not have that. You want to mark the first and the last step. I can't tell you how many people say, I missed the last step. I missed it. one of our friends. He just um, retired from the police force and son of a gun, he missed the last step. Like he's, he's retired for a couple of months and he, now he has a, he had a fracture of his foot. And he's like, I can't even believe it. He's thankful that he's off of work, but son of a gun, that last step. And handrails, make sure you use handrails. There is a story I share with all of my patients, even my 20 year old patients, I just tell them, because they're my patients, they're coming in to address their balance. So we know that off the top. I have to test them on the stairs. I watch them through the stairs and some of them nail it. And some of them, you know, we, we're gonna work on that. But for all of them, I tell them, you're here for your balance. If you fall just walking across the room, you can get seriously injured. You can hit your head, get seriously injured. Um, I've treated ER doctors for their balance or their dizziness. And we have this dialogue and they all say, you know, it's really remarkable how injured a person gets when they fall just from a standing position. Sometimes they land on maybe the back of a chair and it hits, hits their belly. So their internal organs take a, a hit or sometimes they hit their head. So just walking across the floor and falling is super dangerous. Now put yourself on the stairs. It's a nightmare. Some people break their necks, they die or they get a neck injury and they have a, a plegia, a paraplegia, quadriplegia. So the story I share, one of my last patients that I worked with when I lived in Connecticut, I worked at a beautiful hospital called Hospital for Special Care. This woman was 42 years old, her no impairments, living her life, living the life, beautiful, awesome. Two kids are in the car with her husband. She ran in to get some drinks for the ride. She caught her toe on the baby gate and she fell down the stairs. She's now a C6 quadriplegic. You know, she was rushing. So the story is the stairs are critical for safety. Once in a while, some, one of my patients, because I assess them on the stairs, um, they, they, they do it without holding the rail. And I'm like, why are you doing that? And they're like, well, I wanted to show you what I could do. I'm like, never test yourself on the stairs. We'll test yourself in safe environments, but never test yourself on the stairs. Use the handrails. And uh, it's, it's also a, a good idea to have a table either at the top or the bottom of the stairs. So you're not trying to lug everything up or down all at once. Put it on the table. Maybe you have to make two trips. And if you're, if you're really impaired, you might consider a lift or a ramp. And some people, it, depending on what stage in their life and, and their situation, sometimes they consider moving to a, a, a different home environment without stairs. So foot fit, footwear, you want to have safe... Um, sturdy feet uh footwear on your feet here in southern california so many people walk around barefoot you know again i'm from new england i always have slippers on my feet if i don't have shoes on my feet but you uh want to make sure you're taking care of your feet you don't want to be stepping on things and injuring your feet because again it's your foundation and when you wear a slide on shoes which everybody here in southern california it changes the way that you walk a uh, regular walking is you strike your heel and then your foot comes over and then you push off your toes. But in, in slides, people tend to like, scuff their feet. It's a bad habit to get into. Rose, so, this is Kurt. 
Um, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could I ask a quick question related sure. to your previous slides? It's something that I had written down earlier in your presentation. I'm glad yeah. you're addressing environmental factors in the home because it's so important, right? So it's important. where people may spend a majority of their time. And I was wondering, um, you know, many folks may receive uh, physical or vestibular therapy in a facility-based environment. So as a, as a hospital or facility-based um, therapist, how do you address environmental issues in the home without, you know, actually going out to the home? Is it, is it rare that, that a facility-based therapist would actually go out to the home and, and do an assessment and make recommendations? We don't, we don't, we have a whole, so the San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force has a, has a beautiful handout and on the back of it is listed all of the factors for home environments, what to look for. And that's every single one of our patients gets that list. And we just have a dialogue about it. And what if somebody is not capable of addressing those issues at home on their own? Are there any resources or organizations uh, where you know, somebody could lean on an organization to, to have somebody come out and address some of those um, home environmental issues that you know of? I, you know what? I don't know of that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I've been very fortunate in my experience that either the person I'm working with is going to take care of their own home, but oftentimes our, our, our um, patients, our clients have family members with them and they're listening and they're taking notes. And I, you know, I, I, I'm encouraging like their, their very first day after I, I take their subjective information, why they're here, what they're looking for. We ask about their home environment. And then the very first day their homework is, you need to put a rail in your, in your shower. I don't care if you never touch it. That is your homework. Get a rail put in. And so their, their family members will, will take care of that. They just didn't think about it, you know? Yeah, no, that's great information. I appreciate that. And this, the San Diego Fall Prevention, what was the... Um... Oh, San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force. Okay, that sounds like a good resource. San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force. Thank you. And, and they have a wonderful handout. It has facts on falls. It has a... Um, a website, I, you know what, but we, I can get you that information. So uh, back to the footwear, you know, the, you might think of having a more of a strappy sandal that's staying on your foot and allows for better uh, mechanics of walking. And you don't wanna use uh, high heels or anything like that. You just kind of have to be smart about what you put on your feet. So our furniture, you wanna make sure it's not tippy and it's, it's at the right height, that things aren't sticking out and in the way and avoid moving furniture. If you're used to where your furniture is, you may not like, you know, don't, you don't want to be changing it around all the time because if you're tired and you get up in the middle of the night and you, and you just move that, you're going to stub your toe, that could cause a fall. Now the bathrooms, doo -doo -doo, everybody listen to the bathrooms. This is a, the nightmare place for people in falls, you know, cause you're tired, it's in the middle of the night or you're, it's warm, the shower's running or it's slippery. So we want our, our bathrooms to be the most employment and uh, the most safe place, it, or you have impairments with your strength, you've had an injury, it's hard to get off the toilet, you know. So you wanna have grab bars in the tub, the shower, and by the toilet. Anybody who's concerned about their balance, that's the first thing they should put in. They should absolutely put in. And again, if they never touch it, great, you didn't need it. The day that you grab it and it's there, it, you'll be so thankful. You wanna have a toilet seat riser if you need to, so that you're not falling onto the toilet or, or it's hard to get up. Uh, bent, there's bath benches and, and seats, depending on what impairment level you are, what you need and how your bathroom looks, what it can accommodate. Handheld showers are great. Again, the flooring, we don't wanna slip in the bathrooms. We wanna use non-slip bath mats, pick it up after the use. Uh, we wanna have anti-slip tub flooring and, and avoid some of the products that are out there that are, can make flooring slippery and have night lights, especially at night when there can be an urgency and you're, you're, you're not even awake, you're not paying attention, you wanna have a well-lit path to the bathroom. In the community, so if, um, this is kind of personal and professional comment about, you know, if, if you use a cane or a walker, use it. And that's, if you need it, you need it. But I will tell you, if a doctor says, you should use a cane, you look a little unstable, your response should be, why don't I go to therapy to address the problem and learn how to use the device? I, you know, a lot of people, they're sold in, in CVS. People are like, I'm a little off. I'm going to grab the cane. 
I'm like, oh my gosh, you should just, let's work on what the problem is first. And maybe you don't need the cane yet. Or maybe I'll say, use the cane only when you're going to walk too far. You're walking in an unfamiliar environment. You're walking where it's a lot of hustle and bustle, use the cane. But otherwise, let's get your intrinsic factors at their highest working capacity so that maybe you don't need the cane. But if you are, have been told, particularly by a therapist, to use a device, use the device. In the garden, you can use a hoe or something to help with your balance. Take walks with someone. Let's be safe. And we don't want to rush around. I mean, we live our lives in America rushing around. I will tell you, not so much in Southern California. People are a little more chill. But you don't want to rush around. You don't want to have regrets. If you have pain or you're busy or you have a lot of stuff and there's the stairs and you want to get some exercise, the smart thing to do is to use the elevator. In the community, um, what you want to do is you want to, you know, get up slowly from a seat, take a moment before you're walking again, don't rush. In your own home, don't reach for things, walk over to get it. In your, um, in your kitchen, particularly, if there are items that you frequently use and they're at the, like the top shelf or something or the middle, but you put them in a, at a better area, make, let your life easier. You don't want to be falling when you were trying to, to get, you know, that bowl. And then sometimes if you have impairments that don't safely allow you to do things, don't do them. That takes a big hard swallow and a big like, oh, so, you know, for, I don't know, two decades, three decades, four decades, five decades, I've been putting those, that, those decorations up for whatever holiday it is. And, but you've had something happen to you where you're not as good on your feet. It could just be aging in general, or it could be an injury, but you really want the, that uh, decorations out. You, you need to ask for help. It's not worth the risk. One of the other things that inevitably comes up in all of my um, interactions with patients is you got to ask for help. That's it. You got to ask for help with your exercises often. You got to ask for help it to, you know, to move things in your home to make it better for you in the long run. You got to ask for help to put those decorations up because it's not worth the risk. And then what I say about asking for help is in a humbling world, I mean, in, in being human, when you're asking for help, yeah, you're asking for help. You're going to benefit. The person helping you is going to benefit more. You're almost doing them a favor by asking them to help you. I see it all the time. And it's really a, a, a wonderful thing. And again, we don't know what we avoid. <coughs> so uh, a study at Yale University found out that falls are more likely to happen when they, people don't use the handrail. Ah, just hold the handrail. You're leaning too far to reach for something. You're reaching for things overhead. And you lose your balance. I had a patient. She was fluffing her sheets and then she went backwards. Uh, climbing. This is a big one, guys. Climbing on chairs and stools or ladders. You know, you've done it for your whole life, but now you have an impairment. You maybe simply uh, you uh, broke your ankle. I know this is the uh, brain injury foundation. So we, maybe you have a head injury, but a, a simple thing like you break your ankle and, and your ankle's not reacting. And that could have been five years ago, but it's not reacting. You climb on a ladder that puts you at risk of falling. So don't do it. So risk factors for falling. Weakness, a history of falls. If you've had a fall, you're more likely to fall again. Walking deficits. If your gait does not look like a regular gait, that puts you at risk of falling. If you use an assistive device, that puts you at risk of falling. You need to use it if it's been assigned to you and, and you've been educated on how to use it but it does increase, just for the stats purposes, your risk of falling. If you have a visual deficit, if you have arthritis, so that's joint, um, your joints aren't moving as well as they should and you have pain, that increases your risk of falling. If your ADLs, your activities of daily living, if you need help with them or you do it yourself, but modified version of it, that increases your risk of falling. If you're depressed, that increases your risk of falling. You have a cognitive impairment, increases your risk of falling. And then those folks over 80 years of old, they made the list. It increases their risk of falling just because of their age. So what can you do? Well, you guys are doing it. You're here listening to me. I hope it's motivational for you, never mind educational. We can improve ourselves. Do we just have to um, go to therapy for it? 
do you want to have a good diet? We all want to have, you know, good physiques for a million reasons, but part of it is our body movements and we want to be healthy. And that helps with our vision. It helps with everything. We want to have good sleep. We don't want to be tired. We want to have good relationships with people that helps with our balance. We want to exercise regularly and go to the doctor regularly. So have your vision checked. If you're supposed to wear your glasses, wear your glasses. You need your, the best input from your eyes for your balance. But remember, it's not just visual acuity. As a therapist, I'm addressing how your brain is using that visual input. It's not whether you can see or not. I can't fix that. Although if you can't see well and you're supposed to be wearing your glasses, I can tell you to wear your glasses. But it's how your brain interprets the information. Here's an example of this one because it's kind of a weird concept, but someone could be standing and people run by them. Maybe, maybe someone moves quickly by them. That visual information could, could jar them. They, they paid too much attention to it. Their brain felt like they were moving just from a visual input. So we address that in therapy. We teach your brain how to use the input from the eyes, how to pay attention to um, targets when you're moving to help keep with straight paths. You want to have your hearing checked, of course. And if you need hearing aids, wear them. We want to take care of any foot problems and we want to prevent any foot problems that we can by wearing good shoes. And if we don't have good, good sensation, you, we educate people, you need to be looking at your feet. You need a, a handheld mirror. Look at the bottom of your feet. I'll never forget. I, I took the shoes off of a woman to test her feet. And I was like, do you know that you have a wound the size of a quarter on the bottom of your foot? She's like, no, she couldn't feel it. It was almost healed by the time I saw it, but she didn't even know. I mean, that's crazy. So we have to be aware and we have to take care of ourselves. You want to get regular exercise? I mean, everybody needs to get regular exercise. Walking is a great tool for exercise. And to make your walking safer, you want to address your balance issues. I've, I've worked with people who are jogging five miles a day but they still have a balance issue because that motion they've gotten accustomed to, it's straight, they don't look around, they don't, they don't turn their head and they go on an even road. And we still can affect their balance by changing the situation up and, and stimulating all those systems. And the, the bottom uh, line is that's just it, an exercise program with a balanced training component is most effective because uh, we're, we're retraining things that a lot of people aren't even aware can be retrained. We think of exercise as, I'm out of breath, I'm sweating. Woo, I'm getting my heart rate going, right? That's cardiopulmonary exercise. We all know about that. Strength training, oh, my muscles, I'm getting stronger. We all know about that. But what we don't know about that makes my specialty so amazing. When I talk to people, they're like, light, light bulbs go over their heads, is we're retraining the brain to take that input from our bodies and give us a good output. So uh, here you go. Although vigorous exercise reduces the risk of fall-related fractures in seniors or uh, people with physical limitations may require a special exercise program. And that's why you want to go to a specialist. It's like the icing on the cake. You can go to any therapist and benefit. We've all had the same background education. But if, for instance, if you had a shoulder problem, you, I could treat you. Would I? No, I'm not good at it. I haven't done it in 20 years. I mean, if we were, if I was the only one in a, some weird rural environment, I would help you, but I would direct you to the person that focuses on that impairment system, that joint. As for balance, you want to go to a program that focuses on the balance. We've gotten really good at treating it and it's super fun. And depending on what you come in with, it may take, you know, six visits or it may take 26 visits and depending on your insurance and how it all works and your commitment to the home program, you really will benefit from it. We want to take care of ourselves. We don't want to smoke, of course, and we don't want to drink. I mean, drinking, it directly impairs the vestibular system and that can impair your balance. So you also want to talk to doctors about medications. You always want to make sure that your med list is updated and not, you're not just taking things for the sake of taking them. Sometimes things improve in your body and you don't need that medication. Uh, the, the, the list of um, side effects of meds, Typically, the first side effect is dizziness on every med, and that is going to affect your balance. You want to take good care of yourself. Remember to use your assistive device if you've been told to use one by a therapist. If a doctor tells you to use it, 
use it, but also go to the therapist to make sure it's the most appropriate for you to make sure that you need it in all situations. Maybe you need two different kinds of in your home, you're going to use the cane only outside. You're going to use the walker. A doctor would never probably tell you to do that. So you want to go to the therapist to figure out how to use the device and where and when to use the device. If you're ever dizzy or unsteady of numbness, you're confused, or if you fall, you want to uh, call the doctor. We go over falls in therapy. Like if you wound up on the floor, what do you do? I'll tell you right now, the very first thing you do is just chill out. Like don't get panic. Just take a minute assess the situation. Sometimes people want to jump up. They're embarrassed. It happened. They're annoyed. It happened. You just have to stop, assess the situation, make sure that your body's okay. If you have something really hurting after you hit the ground, do not get up. You want to be calling out physically. I need help. Whatever. Call someone's name, take your phone, call 911 to, so they can help you. You don't want to get more injured trying to get up from a fall. And then to get up from a fall, we go over the mechanics of that in therapy too. So you want to clear your clutter. I mean, clearing your clutter is going to do more for you than just um, help you with your balance risk. We, clutter is clutter. You need to clear it. Remove your throw rugs, have good lighting, avoid reaching and climbing, use handrails, and get those bathrooms nice and safe. And don't rush. There's no need to rush. So falling is not a normal part of aging. It's not a normal part of people's lives. So we want to reduce our risk of falling. Any questions? I hope I see a lot of you um, in, my, in my program at Sharp. You know, if you're here and you're interested in this, that's for a reason. And so you should come in. And you know, if, if it only takes one session to just get assessed and get a couple of extra, it would never probably be one session, maybe it'd be one or two, get some exercises to be proactive, do it. That's what, uh, it's 2021, we know better. We have healthcare available to us. So get yourselves in, get assessed, get a program. And I always, one of the first things I have to tell people is look at, I gotta warn you, I'm gonna ask you to do things you can't do. I mean, I have people driving in on their own, walking in on their own, and they're you know 40 years old and whatever. I'm like, you're gonna not be able to do something I ask you to do. And the reason why is I'm gonna ask them to do things. If they can do it, I'm gonna get harder and harder. I'm gonna find that level where they can't do it. And then they're gonna work on it. That their level may be such that it doesn't really bother them in day-to-day -day life, but I know all we're doing is aging and we want to get everything to be working at that awesome level. So, so here's, a, here's another personal comment that I make pretty much with every patient I work with. You are, you're probably fine. We're all fine, right? We're here. We're watching this. We're paying attention. We're fine. You're, you have your day-to-day -day activity. You're fine. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Yeah, everybody's fine. Are you good? Are you great? Are you awesome? I don't know, but that's the potential that we all want to reach to the best of our abilities. And there's always room for improvement. And it's super fun, you guys. It is super, super fun. Oh, absolutely. We recommend yoga for the strengthening portion of it, the mind clearing portion of it, and attention, and the flexibility portion of it. So, yeah. I I don't know that I would recommend, oh, so, and, okay. so, and also like Tai Chi, that mind-body connection. It's a beautiful thing. It's shown to improve your balance. All of those things are great for people who are interested in improving themselves. But if you, any part of you is thinking about doing that for your balance, well, if there's a balance issue, the very first thing you should do is go to see a balance therapist. Yeah. Don't skirt that part. You got to go get your, yeah. get, you know, Get your assessment, find out where your, your impairments lie that, and, and address those and then join those programs. Because, you know, yeah. a lot of programs are group programs, right? Yoga is going to be group. I mean, few of yeah. us would have a one-on-one -on -one. and getting into those positions can be, can put you at risk if you have a balance problem, but doing the therapy first and then progressing to something like that. So it depends on where you are yeah. in your uh, ability on your feet. Oh, that's a great question. So the department I work in is named balance and vestibular rehab. So as a physical therapist, like I told you, if you came with an orthopedic problem, I'm qualified to do it. Would I do it? I wouldn't. You, I want you to go to the people that do that day in and day out. They're better at it. Just like you go to a doctor, you don't go to a podiatrist, a foot doctor for your cardiac problems. 
it's not as designated, <clears throat> excuse me, in physical therapy as it is in medicine. But we all have our specialties and you want to go to the person that it's their specialty. So the balance and vestibular rehab, we look at, remember the three main systems, vestibular is one of them. So if you have any balance deficits, we have to look at how you're using your inner ear. But there's also some patients that only have an inner ear problem. They're, they're you know, 22 years old, super healthy. And one morning they wake up and they roll on their side and they get super dizzy spinning. And they have a problem called benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. This also, in the, the, I'm sharing that diagnosis because it's a common one as people age. The little crystals in the inner ear that are giving weight to the system because we live in gravity, they get dislodged from where they belong and they wind up in the, one of those little canals with the fluid. And when you move, it stimulates that canal, causes an eye movement because that canal told your brain you just did six flips that way and your eyes are gonna adjust to go with your body even though you didn't really do six flips, it was the crystals in the wrong spot, giving the wrong information. So that, that person coming to see me, I'm going to treat them for that, that problem. And maybe they don't even need work on their balance. Cause you know, again, they're 22 year, two years old, no problem. They just had the crystals in the wrong spot. So we treat that vestibular issue. Some people come in with um, like a one side of the vestibular systems off from a viral issue, upper respiratory thing. So they're dizzy. And most of them have a little bit of a balance problem if, if you um, stress it, but they're totally functioning. They're going to work, they're driving. It's not a big balance problem, but they're dizzy. So we treat just the vestibular problem. So a lot of it overlaps, but there are definitely distinct people who only have a balance issue, no dizziness. We tune the vestibular system up or maybe their vestibular system is working and we tune up their... Um, their use of their sensory input. Some, for some reason, their brain's not taking that input in or they have a bad habit of being on one foot more than the other, their posture's off. And we treat just a balance issue. And then some people we treat just a vestibular issue, but lots of people, it's a combination. And again, every therapist learned about this in school, but unless it's your, in your practice regularly, you might not be that good at it. So you wanna go to the person that's good at it. So you go, you have to ask your doctor for a referral for therapy. Okay. So the doctor writes a referral for balance and vestibular rehab, or they could just write balance rehab is fine. And the referral will have your name and your insurance information. It gets faxed to our office. The front desk staff calls your insurance, verifies the insurance, and then they call you to make an appointment. So it starts with your doctor. So it starts with you. You have to want to do this, right? You want to do this. You talk to your doctor. Your doctor has to believe you. It, it's going to benefit you. I can't imagine a doctor not wanting their patient to go to balance therapy, especially if they're asking for it. And then the, the referral comes in. It's like a prescription. The front desk staff gets it, goes through the insurance information, calls you, and you get the evaluation. It depends on where you live in San Diego. So we have Sharp has uh, balance and vestibular departments at Grossmont. I work at Memorial. They have it in Chula Vista. They have it in Coronado. So depending on where you live, you could get the referral faxed to the right office and then move on from there. Yeah. So the general number that you would get the staff at the front office would be 858-939-3866. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's just a general number for rehab. But what I'm going to get you that I, that would be a, a better use would be to um, give you the list of the, the all the hospitals and their phone number and fax number for the doctor's referral. And then maybe even a little a description of what the, the doctor, sometimes they just don't know about this too, you know, who knows what they would write on the referral. Now, okay. you, you're, you're already aware that something's not 100%. And you know what, in my opinion, if it's 98%, let's fix it. All you're doing is aging and other things, you know, our bodies age, you know, things just don't work as well. And so we want to master everything. If you came in and you're eager to learn, you would get, be assessed and maybe you only have two or three visits, you know, right. and then, or you might come in and go, oh my gosh, thank God I came in. And you, right. you have a lot of things to work on. So now, I mean, you're here listening. You made that comment. So I would say you want to tune up. You want to just go check it out. 
They do. So there's a van service. I don't know which sharps have it. I know Sharp Memorial has it, and it's for a certain radius where you live. Sharp Grossmont has a van service. So if you need that, when, when the doctor makes the referral, the secretary checks the insurance, gets it all verified, calls you for your appointment, you have to just say, hey, I need the van service. Okay. And then that, that gets set up. Yeah, that's a great service. It, it can be a little frustrating because they pick you up extra early um, so that everything takes longer, but it's a free service and a lot of people utilize it. You know, I, I wanted to thank Rose. It's a round of applause for Rose. Thank you for your time thank this you. morning. It's a good presentation. So stay tuned for our uh, next speaker group uh, coming up in, uh, in, in June. Um, and I appreciate everybody joining us this morning.